This next gentleman, Walter Worden, is a friend and an extraordinarily gifted soul. He surprises me every time he reads with new work. It's just the way it just comes out. It's breathtaking. He's a visual artist, and he's been writing poetry for decades. He was born and raised in the Hudson Valley, and his recent return to the region has inspired a focus on nature as a means to comment on the human condition, which I editorially applaud and say, well needed. His poems have appeared in various literary publications such as Anthology, Chronogram, the Warwayana Review, the Literary Review, and he is currently producer and host of a reading and performance series. Where is that, Walter? Uh, that, that, uh, it's defunct a few years ago. Oh, it's been defunct. Okay, well, we have another one. We'll resurrect that immediately. It is with great pleasure, Walter Warden. Thank you, Hayden, for those kind words. And thank you all. It's good to see you all here this evening on this cold winter's night. Uh, I have a uh, potpourri of uh, pieces from over the last five or six years and maybe a couple of new ones thrown in. And I want to uh, begin uh, reading a couple of seasonal poems from uh, my book, uh, This Land and Every Stone, which is available this evening. <clears throat> this one is called, I Have a Kinship with the Season. I have a kinship with the season both of us raw against existence, both of us bare to the will of time. I stand like a sturdy oak bedecked only by snow, my thick boughs laden with connected bunches of faux albino leaves. I am the standard in every storm. I give and take as the wind requires. My limbs, though lacking cover, provide protection to the world at my roots. I spike the cold blue sky like a semaphore. In time, I will feel the faraway pulse of April as the ground concedes its grasp and the breaking ice shelves the shore of the nearby lake. And in time, with the appearance of the first buds, the kids will come out to swing my branches. Time pushes slowly the raw season. Time pushes slowly the raw season. Loss upholds the thin air in which I flounder. The trees, black and leafless, stand like stripped soldiers shivering in unkempt columns. They mourn while the war goes on without them. The Febu February sky bows in its gray complexion featuring a cold sun that gives little comfort. In this fruitless, fruitless country, no poem prods the somnolent seed, and no art rises in your long absence. I wait only for winter to concede, wait for silver to bleed from the air, and rocks to ride up, rise up in a napo chorus. Thank you. For some reason, uh, well, I, I know what the reason is. I, I'm more, I'm more um, active poetically in the morning when I first wake up. So I write a lot of morning poems. And this is one. It's called February Dawn. It is how the morning tips toward light, as if the night's weight had merely shifted while the lowering moon rolls through the belt of curdled clouds to settle upon the bleached hills, and squirrels scamper through silence to decorate the bare-branched maples. What little snow is left from the recent storm sparkles in the blue shadows, small tender eyes opening to the day. This is called Timetable. The days, clothed in steel-colored garb, foretell the coming 
the sky white and bloated with its waiting bounty. Yet there is a stubborn stasis. December is here in modest presence. The ground is hard but bare. The intemperate air still as bated breath. Anguish is born from the loss of action, akin to how the weather tarries. The season must show itself in keeping with the calendar, moving with a rhythm of scheduled trains. I have plans for April, which hold no place for snow. So let us both be about our work. Let me arise tomorrow to a white dawn and let it be done. Let the poetry of each season be timely, as I, like each season, must come and go when my time is due. Uh, thank you. This next poem uh, is probably the longest poem I've ever read I, or ever written. I don't know for sure, but it, uh, it's about my youth 60 years ago and my time with my grandfather and my grandmother. It's called Fair Oaks. There was the garage we called the barn where Grandpa kept the black Chevy coupe with the wide running boards I rode at play as firemen, in summers so hot your skin burned when any part of you touched the body. The barn clutched a lip of ledge that fell away to the swamp below where the sumac grew. The state says the swamp is wetlands now, but back then we knew it was just a swamp where mosquitoes bred and bullfrogs raised a base corral you could hear on a breezeless day as far as the shongunks. With each spring rain, it ran to make a lake where Mr. Rhodes planted, planted corn. He brought, he brought in baskets when August came. Too much, he'd tell us, not to give away. Down by the sumac, rhubarb got a hold somehow, which Grandpa picked each season, and which Grandma made into rhubarb pie, setting just enough aside to boil and serve in small plain bowls with sugar sifted over top. Then, too, there was the old dog we called Champ, a frizzle-furred spaniel who came and went as dogs will do, but mostly stayed in hailing distance when Grandpa put the food out, except for the time he discovered the woods that stood dense in dusk beyond Old Seventeen, a stretch of curved cracked macadam we called a highway then. Why he chose that day to gallivant, no one could guess unless he simply fell to some foreign urge, as dogs will sometimes do, to leave his sheltered scheme of lawn and shrub, and brave another region, loping into the line of cars that formed on Sunday afternoons with weekend folks who, having had their weekly fill of country calm and craving the facilitudes of city life, were weary and unwatchful of little dogs. Whatever way misfortune held old champ in hard disdain, if it is so that even dogs must claim a karmic penance, the fact is he was struck and left a lifeless pelt until with sack and shovel Grandpa scooped him off the grabbing tar to take him home. Neither I nor others witnessed that brutal demise, except of course the one who did it and who had to live with knowing. No one mentioned Champ much after, nor could I say where he might rest. A single death among many deaths can go unnoticed. No cause to fear the world will not endure. One day a dog or even a man is there, and then he is no more. Grandpa toiled at Mrs. Bowles, where he kept in good repair the house on Highland Avenue for 50 bucks per week that even then was not enough to live on wearing Grandpa's flesh to bone while his heart pumped blood to wild extreme until the nosebleeds cautioned of calamity to come, which in stubborn German form he did not heed. He must have sensed by some design his wife would go before, as thus she did of Bright's disease, a complication, the doctor said, of the diabetes she suffered with for years, which left her puffed and waterlogged until death pried her loose. In some way, Grandpa left us too. A stroke soon after robbed him of his right side's use. Right arm, like a fallen tree, lightning struck, 
and twisted into wasted shape. Once his body, sure and taut with sinew, toned in surly toil, softened now like fruit left too long upon the ground, and then to nervous tick of slacking muscle. Scripture soothed his final days to corridors of narrow reason, wherein he, his weakening brain deduced a logic of undiscerning stance. Though logic be not the food we crave at last, as food itself must fail. The poet in us all prevails that toward whatever end our life be lived, we leave with what we did not find or framed of bone and flesh. A single death then goes unnoticed. No cause to fear the world will not endure. A man is there and that he is no more. Thoughts on immortality. I tackle all this simple stuff. <laughs> How can we be and then not? Not to breathe? Not to echo the earth's rhythms? Not to go in flesh among the flowers? Not to lie down in green fields? Not to run along long back roads, along silvery brooks, along the shores of seas? Not to dance and sing? not to write poems, not to dream, only to die in utter darkness, to no longer endure but die, to no longer love but die, to live only in the minds of others who would say we had lived and loved and went away as if on a wind like flowers out of season, as did all who came before, all who came to thoughts, who came desires, who came through pain to what we call humanness, as we move on to somewhere else, somewhere in a different way, having finally shirked the hard shell to float, to fly, to go on, perhaps to be again, to be and to be and to be. Thank you. This is called the same hat. One day I was trapped in a waiting room at my mechanics and uh, with another gentleman waiting for our cars to be serviced and he had the exact same hat I was wearing. The same hat. Waiting for my car to be serviced, I sit with mute patience beside another who is wearing the same hat as I. Neither of us acknowledging the other, but related through headdress, both perhaps having bought from the same store the same hat. Our shoulders now so close together, yet making no contact, our attentions the same, fixed upon a poster regarding the benefits of synthetic motor oil, which hangs on the opposite wall. Our tastes the same, probably our lives the same, both of us waiting while our cars are being repaired, both of us lost in the quietude, fearful of voice, fearful of disturbing the soft structure of separation. He, with the purpose I share, the relative dreams, the love for our families and friends, both of us enduring without mutual recognition, staring straight ahead in the otherwise empty room, alive but dead, wearing the same expression, wearing the same hat. This is called Capital Punishment. I'll get into a few political poems here. Right or wrong, good or bad, who will question? Who will have courage to frame the argument? Who will pose the prosecution? Who will be judge and jury? Who will dare to testify? Who will decide the last meal? Who will be clergymen to provide final comfort? or jailer to walk the last mile? Who will read the writ? Who at late hour will stand with palsied hand poised for the saving call which will never come? Who will be cursed to be last to mourn when with clock ticking we carry out the sentence on ourselves? This is Walls. Now we speak of walls, walls to secure, 
walls to keep out, walls to keep in. Stone upon stone, brick upon brick, masons working mortar, filling cracks so sunlight cannot squeeze through, so air is diverted and water rechanneled to keep the future out and fear in. So over time, we are challenged to sense, challenged to see, to feel the shared pulse of those who live in that other country, challenged to touch and be touched by what is created, what is overcome, what is endured, what is loved without us. This is lost him to the middle class. We of the earth work daily for food, for faith, for the little breaths between the terrors. The market takes its shaky ride as we of common stature keep our stride, our souls to the wheel. We came up proudly in the boxes our fathers bought on the GI Bill, outfitted with carports and plastic pools. We rode high with Glenn and rebelled with Dean. We watched the Beatles sing our lives on Sullivan. We found our faith in the green hell of the Mekong, our brotherhood in the muddy fields of Bethel. Now billionaires vacation all year in Ibiza and purchase politicians at wholesale prices. In summer, our kind collect in city, inner city parks and suburban backyards. Our quiet legacies lost in the smoke of weekend beer-charged barbecues and burning plans. The Rotarians march every 4th of July, and like our fathers, we die at 50. I think it was like almost two years ago now. <clears throat> this next poem uh, started out as another poem and ended up uh, uh, a little more angry than I had intended. It's simply called Flagpole. Years ago, our neighbors put, up, put one up in their yard, tucked in a corner as if intended as if they intended its purpose would never come to pass, as in fact, in all the decades of Memorial Days and Fourth of Julys, I have never seen a flag flo flown from it. And now the softened soil in which it stands, one nation under God, has made it tilt to 10 degrees. And over time, my maples have grown large enough to hug it with their limbs, as if its unadorned shaft were an indecency the leaves obscuring most of its naked midsection with just the brass bulb on its tip remaining visible. The new neighbors seem to care no more than their predecessors, the pole to them representative of some ancient relic they had to take on. The weather eats its metal. It is sad to me that it might never serve for what it was meant to be, that no one thought enough to set it straight and yet there it stands, a tribute to the intentions of those long ago and to those loyal who each day see it as a sign of peril, a ship's spar leaning to the storm. <clears throat> a friend of mine has a garden each summer full of kind of lilies. And <clears throat> I wrote this for her, this is for Shanti. Kana lilies. It happens nearly overnight when at a soupy gray dawn after a light drizzle, like beheaded Victorian ladies responding coquettishly to suitors' attentions, they slowly rise, their, their, slowly raise their crimson plumes above floppy leaves to shock us with delight. Under the magnolia in late afternoon over oolong tea, we watch them wave in a warm breeze that carries their scent over the garden, both of us laughing giddily as you name each one, your way of giving birth. This is, this is last of the line. We visited on Christmas and birthdays, climbing the narrow dirt drive that only one car could negotiate at a time, 
until we reached the reverent oak that stands just below the summit where the family plot occupies less than a quarter acre of ground. It is, a modest, it is modest by any means, a single gray granite monument, our surname chiseled into its shiny surface with lesser stones similarly marked with the names of the deceased and the dates of births and deaths, denoting where each now rests. In the old days, we often brought flowers we laid carefully on the breast of each grave in lieu of a hug. My mother, who faithfully made the trek up Pine Hill for decades, now occupies a space among her forebears. Placed between my grandfather and grandmother, she is, in the, ge she is the gem in the center of the necklace that has formed a half moon around the oak, perhaps where the diamond or ruby would be set. Alone and, the rest, and the, alone and the last of us all, I find it hard to go there now, as if a larger responsibility has befallen me, that I should be more than custodian, more than bouquet and wreath bearer. I cannot be everything now to these familiar bones, these souls I had treasured in flesh. Now I can only be the last, a malingerer, who perhaps has failed in my duty, who allows no sense of ghostly presence, no calm, and no place here on earth or in heaven I can claim. The Late Watch. In those smooth, unenlightened days of few regrets, I filled my pipe and smoked, still too young to see distance, too full of false adventure to leave, to be away too long from the soft furniture of my imagined home, where only shadows were uninvited and the wrists were but small rodents confined to the walls, scratching occasionally, but so careful not to show themselves. In every room my chosen ghosts remained always out of, out of light, waiting for their time, and I waiting too, not knowing when light leaves at last, what hour they will come down the darkened hallway in a great wayward wave of disappointments, a desperate horde of homeless shadows, bearers of lost faith, ragged refugees crossing, crossing Lethe. This is a debt to time. You accuse me of wasting time, not knowing how time wastes me. No matter my trial or venture, he is always at the door, wanting more, smiling and looking smart in a new necktie with his hand out. <laughs> This, is other, this next little ditty uh, I wrote in, uh, in response to a uh, famous folk poem. It's probably the first poem most of us ever really learned, uh, The Red Wheelbarrow. And uh, I, I listened to uh, Dr. Williams on, on a uh, recorded radio show years ago, and he was asked during the interview what the poem symbolized and why it was such an iconic poem. And he really didn't know. <clears throat> so, um, for, uh, for uh, uh, context, I'll read the poem and then I'll read my answer. It's really in the form of a note. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain beside the white chickens. To Dr. Williams. Dear sir, Tell me, please, why a wheelbarrow? Why chickens, and why must they be white? Wouldn't geese do as well? Why does the rain glaze everything? Is it a blessing or a curse? Is it a warm spring rain or a cold rain in autumn? And why, sir, must so much depend on anything? This next one is uh, it's a poem that came out of uh, an, ex an experience where we, I was helping my friend decorate her house. And 
We sat late in the afternoon admiring our work. It's called Late Afternoon Respite. The Merlot has diminished to one third bottle and still we sit in the shadowing silence of the front room with only brick and glass to save us from the noise of Stanbridge Street and all the world's absurdities. Here near day's end, we briefly lounge, collected artwork decorating the walls and objects dark of your life's adventures occupying select positions on the polished oak floor. In reverent form, Hindu icons hold forth upon the mantelpiece. Last shafts of sunlight spill through stained glass, splashing leaves of fica and ferns and hues of reds and purples and adding new designs to the bright oriental. I feel you smiling in the gathering dusk as the good wine does its work to enhance our contentment. Mellow strains of Haydn issuing faintly from the neighbor's speakers, contributing to our special time. For the time is ours, and we are carried on it through day and darkness, like travelers between worlds who are happy with the ride, brief though it is, happy with the sense that time is irrelevant, that time, though briefly, is ours to possess. Now, since this is February in the uh, month of love, I have a couple of love poems. Well, they have the word love in them anyway. <laughs> Yesterday I thought I was in love. Yesterday I thought I was in love. A smile perhaps had lured me, or, well -modeled, or a well-modeled length of leg, or a question answered with unencumbered wit. All I know of her is the name she gave me, the constancy of her carelessness, and the bravado of her clipped goodbye. Leaning near the fountain, I saw she had a certain sway, and she moved out of shade as she moved out of shade across cobblestones, passing the guitar player, the ice cream cart, scattering pigeons. A young boy running with a yellow balloon abruptly stopped to watch her. All this I blame. You. Uh, you kill me for time, Hayden? Huh? This is called Love is Hard to Carry. And it, it begins with a uh, line from uh, an Allen Ginsberg poem. The weight of the world is love. Love is hard to carry. Heavy as a rucksack of stones slung from the shoulders. Or the dead weight of a body you are desperate to move out of light heavy because the body is yours. Love is hard to carry because of its bulk, because it is not easy to get hold of, forcing you to drag it where you want it, drag it like a wrecked dream no longer useful. Love is hard to carry because of its shape, irregular and unwieldy, because it has no center of balance, no stable state, making you bang the walls on the way up the stairs. Love is hard to carry because you can't see where it begins or where it ends or how high it is, but you deal with it anyway. For without such weight, how will you know it's worth? Without such burden, how will you know it's there? I'll close with... Uh, I'll take you into spring at, uh, as I close, the far edge of winter. There is a time when you have to wait at the far edge of winter, when snow is gone but the sun is reticent, stalled above a thick roof of white clouds, a time when rain comes and goes in an, as an, at an hourly rate, and temperatures might reach high 50s for a day or two, just warm enough to take you in, make you part of the conspiracy, force you to tell family and friends it won't be long now. There, there, see? Already something is green and glorious as you point to a tiny burst in the blue shade of the willow, a short verdant prayer bright along the creek. Thank you all very much. <laughs>